Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Ayşe Süberkaj. Relations between Turkey and France have reached their lowest point in recent memory. The two countries have found themselves on the opposite sides on many issues. From the war in Libya to disputes in the eastern Mediterranean, the two NATO allies have repeatedly traded public barbs and threats. And those disagreements were on full display at a regional summit hosted by France, which was supposed to address maritime tensions. Not present at the summit, Turkey blasted French President Emmanuel Macron's earlier remarks when he said he would get tough with President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. This year has seen Ankara and Paris face off in a series of disputes, including a heated naval standoff in June that almost reached crisis point. And the energy-rich waters in the eastern Mediterranean have become an even more dangerous flashpoint. Last month, France participated in naval exercises with Greece near waters claimed by Turkey. So, have relations between the two reached rock bottom? Is there room to improve or is the Mediterranean region headed for an era of tensions? And joining me now, François Bourgat, who is a member of the European Council on Foreign Relations, and Giray Sadek, who is an Associate Professor of International Relations at Ankara Yildirim Beyazıt University. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. Giray, so have relations between Turkey and France reached rock bottom? Have they been ever worse than this? Uh, well, um, we may need to dig up for that, but uh, when it comes to the current moment, certainly it's one of the bottom lines, uh, especially after recent uh, French uh, involvement in the Eastern Mediterranean in support of one-sided support of uh, Greece and Greek Cypriots against Turkey, uh, make the issues worse, in addition to uh, the already brewing conflict such as in Libya, in Syria, we see France uh, all in the front uh, against Turkey. Mm -hmm. So this year, France seems to have been especially active in directly confronting Turkey, whether it's, as you've just mentioned, Eastern Mediterranean or in Libya or in Syria. Francois, what is behind this? Behind this, uh, let's put some history. Uh, Turkey um, is the strongest, the most powerful non-European player in the Mediterranean. So there's always been some kind of competition between the two. But, but in 2002, there's been an, a new layer, which is AKP uh, coming to power. And then a third one, France adhering uh, in the context of the post-Arab spring to this alliance with the Emirates, with uh, Saudi Arabia, with uh, Egypt uh, more explicitly than ever with Israel. And, and these two last layers, they connect because the narrative of this alliance, which we could label counter-revolutionary mm -hmm. uh, alliance, is using the vocabulary, the narrative of criminalizing political Islam, whatever it means. Yeah, but... So, Mm -hmm. This is why the situation is uh, is becoming uh, dangerous because we, when Macron opposes Turkey, we do not know if he is doing a rational understanding of France's interest in the Mediterranean or if he is fueling his own electoral interest because it is uh, now uh, become a, a, a kind of mode, a, a kind uh, of game to yes. criminalize uh, Muslims inside so it's become a domestic yeah Mac macron so in his this, yes but but macron in his latest statements he said he doesn't have any problems with the turkish people but with the erdogan government we see he has no problems with the pkk he has no problems with haftar in libya or sisi in egypt or any of monarchies in the gulf so um Giray, is macron's confrontation with turkey directly tied to his personal view of erdogan uh, that is uh, clearly a factor, especially in terms of recent escalation. Uh, we see a, a way for that. But other than that, targeting uh, a democratically elected leader is another faux pas in French terms. And uh, coming uh, flash forward from history, it is that uh, we need to keep in mind um, that France is no longer the gendarmerie of the Sahel region, neither it is the big brother in eastern Mediterranean. 
uh, in which uh, regions Turkey has uh, historical and substantial roles, especially in Eastern Mediterranean with the longest uh, coastline. Uh, so uh, insisting on this French narrative, for whatever reason, it could be, as earlier speakers said, for domestic political gain or uh, populist rhetoric of Macron, but still uh, that, uh, that hurts EU, that hurts NATO, and ultimately that hurts France and leads uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and MENA region further into instability and leading to lose-lose situation, uh, meaning further instability for the yes. region and the countries of the region and for the France in the end, in terms of the effect of France. Yes, yeah, so, uh, Francois, before the uh, Med 7 summit in Corsica, Macron said Turkey is no longer a partner in the region, ignoring the fact that the Turkey has the longest coastline in the Mediterranean. Do you think other countries in this regional group um, agree on Tur taking a firm stance against Turkey in the upcoming period? No, I'm not really convinced. Uh, let's remember, if we want to be optimistic, that Macron has used the uh, hard, uh, aggressive vocabulary uh, yesterday. But uh, on a previous issue, he has also said that there would be negotiation in this issue. So it means that Macron recognized this, that the demands of uh, exclusive economic zone by Turkey are not illegitimate and they will be negotiated. So I think that once again, there is the hard talk for domestic issues, but there is no way out of a more rational attitude by Macron in the coming weeks, especially since we may say that EU is not fully um, unanimously following him on this in this direction. Yeah, uh, Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel has tried to play a mediating role between Turkey and Greece. Will France's uh, confrontational approach hurt that effort? And can you, uh, Giray, speak on the differences between mm -hmm. Berlin and Paris and how they are addressing the tensions between the two NATO allies? That is really important. Uh, Berlin is uh, approaching in a more balanced manner and uh, trying to mediate a solution, trying to have EU as a power broker, if not power broker, at least honest broker. But French efforts hold, hurt also EU legitimacy as an honest broker by declaring uh, their support in recent Med 7 summit to, to Greeks, uh, uh, France, and therefore uh, EU robbed themselves from whatever legitimacy left uh, to be considered uh, as honest broker uh, in this issue. And in that regard, it's important to remember those MED7 block is seven EU countries with Mediterranean coastline, but they are not representative of EU. We need some 20 plus members. Yeah. On top of that, they are not representative of Eastern Mediterranean because only two of them uh, have uh, some minor costs in Eastern Mediterranean, which combined uh, Greek and Greek Cypriots have less than uh, Turkish uh, coast and uh, yeah. also we need to consider Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. So they are not representative either of EU or the region. I understand. So Francois, could France's hostility towards Turkey uh, be tied to Paris's declining influence in its uh, former colo colonies in North and West Africa? Those Because those regions are now, Turkey is expanding its uh, influence. What do you make of it? Yeah, de definitely this, this is part of, 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 of the frame of the picture. Uh, you know, France uh, needs every single uh, so-called democratic elected leader needs an enemy. Um, rationally, France should oppose Putin because in the case of, uh, of Libya, for instance, yes. uh, we could say what we say to Turkey, we could say to Putin, but Putin is a little too big. So Macron has chosen, uh, chosen to, to uh, address uh, Erdogan. So I think uh, so once again, we must remember that in the position of Macron, there is a double um, ambition. One is foreign policy, the other one is a dom domestic issue, uh, hard talk against a Muslim uh, political player, the strongest of the landscape. Uh, but but if, I, if we conclude in a positive um, direction, I think that it is absolutely impossible that France sticks to its confrontational uh, language 
it will move toward renegotiating this very vicious uh, decisions of international so, so law. Do, so do you uh, think do you think economic exclusive do you think not maybe France but Macron considers Turkey to be a bigger threat to NATO than Russia? It, it is not a, a bigger threat. It's an easier threat to address, politically speaking, than opposing uh, Putin. Uh, I don't know if you know the, the, the story of uh, uh, President Sarkozy uh, being uh, assaulted privately by Putin. They, they know that the, the idea, uh, I'm not meaning that it's easy to confront uh, President Erdogan, but it's easier than confronting Putin. So I don't think that uh, the core of the understanding of Macron is that uh, President Erdogan is dangerous, more dangerous uh, as a rival than Putin is, but it's yes. a more common enemy to address. So, Girai, how do you think this tension uh, be dealt with moving forward? Moving forward, something to, uh, to add. Uh, Perhaps Macron tries to calculate that, not that Erdogan is uh, easier than Putin, but he may have the impression that uh, French narrative against Turkey is likely to gather more uh, EU support and to limited extent support from the region uh, than against Putin. But uh, that may be a significant miscalculation here. Um, earlier speaker mentioned France's double ambition, that's to the point. There is also France double standard we need to talk about. On the one hand, France is calling, including in recent summit, uh, for um, de-escalation in Eastern Mediterranean yes. and negotiation and so on. On the other hand, France is uh, pressuring Greece to demand preconditions for uh, NATO deconfliction talks, yeah. asking for a uh, lion's share of Greek arms imports for French defense industry, and asking basis uh, in Greek from Greek Cypriots. Yes. So uh, those are totally uh, mismatches, to say the least, uh, if not discourse action disparities, which are significant to hurt Macron yes. and France in the long All term. All right, gentlemen, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. It's been nearly a decade since Istanbul last heard the roaring engines of a Formula One race car. But soon the city's motorsport fans will be able to enjoy the return of the Turkish Grand Prix. With the races scheduled for late November, having an outdoor event could bring a sense of joy to cap off a very trying year. Adel Halem has a story. Calling all F1 fans, circle November the 15th on your calendar. The Turkish Grand Prix will be back at Istanbul Park for the first time since 2011. 220 fazla. This race will be held with spectators. The track has a seating capacity of more than 220,000. If we curb more than half of that for social distancing, up to 100,000 people will be able to watch the race here, sitting distantly. F1 initially planned 22 races for this year. Then, when the pandemic hit, it looked like COVID-19 would wipe out the entire season. In July, races started resuming. But more than three months behind schedule, several events had to be scrapped. Enter the Turkish GP. With its mild November weather and a tried and tested track, Istanbul is an ideal late addition to the calendar. Turkey has excellent sporting facilities. We're capable of hosting big events domestically and internationally. And even better than many developed countries with the hospitality of Turkish people. When it comes to hosting international events, Turkey has become a desired country. The venue is anticipating about 20,000 foreign tourists. We think that there will be at least a $50 million worth cash flow from abroad, and also local ticket sales from Istanbul and other parts of Turkey. Revenue that would be helpful in diluting the economic impact of the virus. Organizers have been in talks with F1 to get the Turkish Grand Prix back on the grid since 2017. And considering how long it's been since the Turkish GP was held here, nearly a decade, only three active drivers, Lewis Hamilton, Sebastian Vettel and Kimi Raikkonen, have ever won a race right here at Istanbul Park. Turkey doesn't have a long history with Formula One. 
just seven races beginning in 2005. And throughout the latest negotiations, the presidency has supported and encouraged the deal. We signed a one-year contract because of the pandemic. Once this race is successfully completed without a hitch, I can say that both sides are willing to turn this into a long-term contract. And that would be good news for fans. Tickets start at just $4 a day for general admission, and organizers are hoping the Turkish GP will be in pole position for a permanent slot on the F1 grid. Adil Halim, Straight Talk, Istanbul. And joining me now from Istanbul is Jason Tahincioğlu. He is a former GP2 driver and Formula One expert. And joining from London, Greg Stewart, who is a staff writer at Formula One's official website. Gentlemen, welcome to Straight Talk. It's good to have you on the program. So after an interval of nine years, Turkey's intercity, Istanbul Park, will be hosting Grand Prix in November. Jason, how do you feel about it? Amazing feeling, obviously. We're we're proud to be hosting the race again after nine years, and obviously, you know, being being able to host, you know, the the pinnacle of mood sports again is just remarkable. I mean, we're going to welcome it no matter what. So just bring it on. Mm. So, uh, Greg, I've read you are excited that the uh, <laughs> F1 will be run in Turkey in 2020. Why are you uh, so excited about it? Are there incredible memories? Uh, well, I mean, you know, since 1995, basically all tracks have been designed by uh, a guy called Herman Tilke, but it's sort of understood that Istanbul Park is his crown in glory. And, you know, watching the 2020 cars go around that track is going to be an incredible sight and something that, you know, I think all F1 fans are looking forward to. I know all the F1 drivers are very excited to go back as well, so it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, is Istanbul... Grand Prix and especially a challenging one for you? Well, I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a hugely challenging circuit um, and it's sort of, uh, it's crowned by turn eight. I mean, Jason will have been around it, so he'll have more of an idea yeah. than me. But in the, uh, I mean, in the current cars, they're going to be generating over 5G going around turn eight, which is a, a long multi-apex left-hander. So it's going to be a huge challenge for the drivers in the current cars. And uh, yeah, the necks are going to be hurting a lot by the end of the weekend. That's for sure. So uh, Jason, as a uh, former race car driver, tell us about this turn eight, why it is uh, so appealing and famous among the drivers and for drivers. What's about it? Well, it's fast, it's very fast, it's long, it's very long, and it's anti-clockwise, which means it's unusual, let's say. So, you know, obviously these cars are going to be generating at least, you know, a minimum speeds of 170 miles, probably about 280 kilometers now around that. And that's minimum speed. So entry and exit, you're, you're talking about, you know, an average of 180, kilo, 180 miles an hour, which is around 300 kilometers. So, and, uh, uh, um, you know, they'll be generating probably more than 5G and that's constant G. So we're talking about five and a half, six Gs for about, you know, six seconds at least. And that's that's fighter jet territory when you think about it. And the current cars, the 200, uh, 2020 spec cars are going to be doing it pretty easily, I must say. So I think the cars are not going to be challenged, but the drivers will be. So again, that's interesting. But at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the race is about 50 odd laps and we'll see who has the strongest neck. So um, the only current drivers, if I'm not uh, mistaken, to have won in years past at Istanbul Park are Kimi Raikkonen and six-time world champion Lewis Hamilton and four-time champion Sebastian Vettel. Is it enough for excitement? What are we expecting to see in this year's races? Greg, you can continue. Well, I'm or Jason. Okay, it's fine. Now, I mean, I'm just going to say, you know, whoever has been to the circuit before is is looking forward and coming back to the circuit. And as you said, there's only about been about three or four people. I think Grosjean raced here in, in GP2 as well. So he's going to be back racing here again in a Formula One car. And he's probably excited as well. But, you know, I'll, I'll let Greg get, get, give the rest. <laughs> yeah, Greg, Greg. Yeah. But, but of course, there's another aspect to this, which is, of course, the last race they had was in May 2011. They're going to be racing in November Climatic conditions are going to be different, so the teams won't have any meaningful data they can use. So it's going to be this unknown for lots of drivers. You know, um, some of them will have done it on their their sims at home, their home simulation rigs. 
Uh, but, you know, it's going to be going into the unknown for a lot of drivers. So mm -hmm. that adds an, an interesting element to the weekend. Uh, and it's something that it's one of the positives that come out of the coronavirus yeah. situation is that it's forced us into these new areas and places that we wouldn't have gone to or gone back to ordinarily. So. Yeah, this it's, year, uh, yeah, this year has presented Formula One and the world uh, with an unprecedented challenge. Uh, how has COVID nineteen impacted the races, revenues, viewership, and maybe most importantly, drivers' psychology? And how do you see the world sports moving forward amid this pandemic? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, you know, it sounds a bit silly to say it, but Formula One's lifeblood is racing, you know when cars aren't going around tracks, it, it obviously has an impact on, on the business. Uh, I think we've navigated it as best we can. And, you know, I think the positive for us as a company is that mm -hmm. I think we took a very Formula One approach to it when it became clear that racing was possible under very strict scenarios. And so we, we looked at the rules, worked out how best you could actually put on Grand Prix and then set about doing it. And we've managed to build out a 17 race calendar, which is going to take place in six months. So I think everyone's going to be very tired at the end of this year. But, you know, that's only five Grand Prix less than we planned to do in 2020 anyway. Mm -hmm. So we've sort of, everyone's put their shoulder to the wheel and managed to create this calendar. And as I, as I said, it's provided this opportunity to, to go to places like Istanbul Park, to go to tracks like Imola, Mugello, Portimao in Portugal. So... You know, I don't think anybody would have wished for the coronavirus pandemic, but I think there have been positives to come out of it, and I think we've navigated it quite well. So uh, Turkish organizers, Jason, plan to host about 100,000 fans with record low ticket prices at just $4 a day. So is this uh, doable? And uh, are you hopeful that Turkey will get a permanent spot on uh, F1? if uh, this event goes successfully? Well, thinking about the, the previous generation, let's say, of age is, has seen Formula One come to this country, but the current generation hasn't. So, and you know, think considering that the current generation obviously is interested in Formula One, let's say, and they haven't seen a Formula One car go around a Turkish track, they're going to be interested. They're going to come, they're going to want to come, especially when the ticket prices are so low. So I think we should be expecting a good amount of crowd once, and obviously, once they're in the circuit, it'll, they'll decide wherever they want to sit and watch the races. Mm -hmm. And um, but you know, again, it's it's just one of those things. We've 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 had this issue in in the past with the, with the spectators. But I really really think you know we we could be looking at you know at least those hundred thousand tickets or tickets being sold, and it it will look good on TV. We'll probably see that. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, I've been reading some comments from fans uh, who are mm -hmm. caught up in between the COVID-19 scare and the temptation to watch the world's, let's say, most popular races with a record low ticket prices. Uh, Greg, what's your take on that? Will you come, for example? Uh, I, I won't be there. I'll be uh, remote working in lovely London. But um, I would love to go. And, you know, I just think... We, we obviously look at it very closely. There's obviously this sort of bubble situation that we have in the paddock at the moment where everybody's sort of split apart into different groups. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a fine balance. We love having fans come to Formula One races. We're going to have the Italian Grand Prix this weekend with no fans at Monza, which is sort of totally anathema, really. But um, as soon as people can come back safely... Uh, you know, we can't wait to see people back. Mm. So, uh, and uh, Jason, we just mentioned that Turkey wants to get a permanent spot on uh, mm -hmm. F1 uh, calendar. What are the main challenges uh, before that objective, to your opinion? I mean, obviously, they'll have to be hosting a brilliant race here. I mean, the previous seven races that have been hosted between 2005 and 2011 have been very well in terms of organization. And I mean, I think Greg will probably know that this season has pretty much been like a force majeure season where obviously we've had this pandemic, but we've still had the, the Formula One management has still managed to actually fill a 17 or give us at least a 17 race, you know, a season. So which is amazing. So I'm guessing whoever was going to be a part of the 2020 season originally will be a part of it 2021 so unless there's like a 
someone's going to drop out or something. We don't. We were not sure whether F1 is going to be a Turkey is going to be having an F1 race next year, uh, unless there's going to be 22 races, which I don't think because I think they're completely limited to 22 races, or else mm. the mechanics say they're going to get you know probably divorced from their wives or or not have any families <laughs> left because it's obvi because obviously they're they're away from their family or their home for a long long time. All right, gentlemen. Unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining us on Straight Talk. I appreciate it a lot. And that's all for this edition of Straight Talk with me, Aisha Subarkash. If you've got any comments, follow us and tweet us at Straight Talk TRT. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until next time, take care and goodbye.